Fishbunt. <laughs> Fishbunt. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It's Yiddish. I'm feeling in a Yiddish sort of mood. I guess because I watched Unorthodox. And I like speaking Yiddish from time to time. Fishfunt means finished, as in finito, as in no mas, as in finir. That's the French verb, to be finished, to finish. Who's finished? I got an update. Our main man, Kyle Larson. Remember the NASCAR dude? Remember the guy who's doing eye racing? The guy brought up through the NASCAR diversity program because he's half Japanese. We talked about him yesterday. You're loyal. You listened to yesterday's Nothing Personal. And we talked about the fact that his racing team, remember which the racing team was? Chip Ganassi. It's a team, right? And they had a whole statement that they were going to speak to all the relevant parties. Well, guess what? It didn't take long because no one had to fly anywhere. They did it by Zoom. They may have just texted, or maybe they watched the show and realized they don't actually have to speak to any parties. Maybe they were never going to speak to any parties. So here's what they said. After much consideration, Chip Ganassi Racing has determined that it will end its relationship with driver Kyle Larson. As we said before, which by the way was yesterday, I just put the parentheticals in. The comments that Kyle made when he used the N-word, that's me saying what he did in case you can't remember what I said yesterday and what he said yesterday. The comments that Kyle made were both offensive and unacceptable, especially given the values of our organization. All right, I got to stop right there. Especially given the values of organization. What organization has values where racism is okay? I'm just curious. Why do you write in a statement, especially given the values of organization? Well, because it is especially. If our organization had different values, we may have just suspended him and not actually terminated him. Or if he were one of the best drivers and racers on the circuit, we would have really had to evaluate the situation. But given the values of organization, especially. Then they continued. As we continue to evaluate the situation with all the relevant parties, it became obvious that this was the only appropriate course of action to take. (sighs) Who writes these? Just tell me. Who writes these? Because if you're the PR person working for Chip Ganassi Racing, you're fired. I'd fire you. I would fire you. Terminate. You'd be fishfunt, finished. Why? You can't let your bosses put things in statements that you know are laughable. You can't let your bosses put things in statements that you know as an accomplished public relations executive have no chance of passing the smell test. As we continue to evaluate the situation with all the relevant parties, who exactly are the relevant parties? Oh, I know. I got it. Thank you. The relevant parties are all the sponsors who walked away from Kyle Larson. They called the sponsors and said, really, you're not going to keep supporting him, but your money is the money we use in order to get his car on the road or on the track. Is that a relevant party or is it people who engage in racial sensitivity training where they said, hey, man, there's nothing we can do. Sorry. So sorry as we continue to evaluate the situation with all the relevant parties, just give me one small break, one time. Just say it. Kyle Larson violated the rules of being a public figure and the rules of having people pay to watch you do what you do. The number one rule, you know it from yesterday, repeat it after me. Come on, studio audience of zero, repeat it after me. Don't be a racist. That'll do it. Kyle Larson is totally verschwunt. Finished. Sponsor's gone. He's just gone. God, it happens fast. By the way, an unintended consequence, a tangential problem as it relates to coronavirus. This happened because he was participating in a virtual race. So followed by fans. So many people watching. 
and they microphoned up the players, the drivers. So we overheard Larson talking to someone where in the real world, if the racing were happening on the track, no one would have ever heard it. If no one hears a racist comment, is it still a racist comment? You're damn right it is. Major League Baseball made an announcement today. I want to explain it. Major League Baseball through the commissioner said that salaries by certain league employees will be reduced by 35% average. And the league has agreed to pay all of its employees through May 31st. So let me tell you how the MLB commissioner's office works. The 30 teams in baseball are actually the people who own the commissioner's office. The commissioner works for the 30 owners. The 30 teams in baseball pay the expenses of the commissioner and the commissioner's office. It is a line item that is in every team's budget. But the commissioner's office generates revenue for the teams. So, for example, the teams give Major League Baseball permission to negotiate national TV contracts, which get split 30 ways. They give permission to Central Baseball, the commissioner's office, to sell national sponsorships. Those are split 30 ways. It's called Major League Baseball Properties. Individual teams give baseball the right to run the MLB network, to run MLB.com and that whole business. That revenue is split 30 ways. It's not necessarily distributed all of the revenue and all of the profit, but that money is the property of the 30 teams equally. So while it's great that MLB is doing this and the commissioner and his lieutenants are cutting their salaries 35%, it is absolutely a, um, they're all under contract. Many of the top executives are. And if you're under a contract, you're under no obligation so when networks are asking or companies are asking contracted employees to take a pay cut, those employees are under no obligation to take that pay cut if they're under contract. Of course, they're going to be subject to public ridicule. If someone making $10 million a year is not willing to take a 35% pay cut and only make $6.5 million for this coming year, then that person, while it's his or her right, will still be looked at askance by their bosses and by the general public. What we don't know from this announcement is whether or not this is a deferral of any pay cut or if this is a permanent pay cut. The reason why we don't know that is we're never going to know that. That's decided within the four walls of Major League Baseball Commissioner's Office and a few members of the Executive Council, the Compensation Committee. Not the Competition Committee, the Compensation Committee. Why is it necessary for Baseball Commissioner's Office to redo their contracts. Why is it necessary for them to relook at their budgets? It's the same reason that every single company, large and small, is doing the same thing. And in baseball, there is no way to know what the revenue model will be going forward. There's no way to know how many years it will take to get back to being an $11 billion business. For all people who think that their businesses will turn on like a light switch, the anti-Book of Mormon, if you're listening, Josh Gad, turn it off like a light switch. It's no little more men trick. We do it all the time. Do you really think that when we turn the lights on that everything goes back to normal immediately? Is it not possible in your mind to live in a world where until there's a vaccine for coronavirus, there will be no fans at sporting events, at concerts, there will be no large public gatherings? I can't guarantee it yet. I'm not ready to make it a wait to see, but I'll tell you, I'm getting close. I'm getting close on several major pronouncements, like no minor league baseball season, period. Like no way to restart the NFL, the uh, NBA, or the NHL unless they're willing to absolutely impact future years. I already told you NFL training camp's not going to start in July. There's a lot going on, folks. Let's keep our eye on the ball. We spent a lot of time watching fighting, partisanship fighting going on, coming out of the White House. We're trying to get updates. We're trying to find a way to have intelligent people in economics and in health find a way to reopen society and how it's going to work. It will not be a light switch.
It will have to be done in counterparts. That's a legal word. When things are done in counterparts, have you ever signed a lease to rent a place, rent your house, or sometimes a lease to rent a, or buy a car? Something that is executed in counterparts means you don't have to be in the same room signing the exact same piece of paper. If there's a signature page that has two lines on it, you could sign it, send it in. Then someone else signs, the other part sends it in. You put them together and you've got a fully signed document. That's how this country is going to reopen. It's going to be done in counterparts. Different parts of the country will open at a faster pace. Public gatherings. That is one thing that I don't think will be done in counterparts. It will be wholly irresponsible for one part of the country to have public gatherings, risk the possibility of infection, and then all of a sudden, those people can fly anywhere and go to cities or towns or states where there, where there are no longer public gatherings because they have not been allowed. I think where this ends up, any of you have kids or uh, did you ever go to camp or ever have to take a physical? So we would take physicals every year in baseball, right in spring training, we'd go and there'd be a doctor, an eye doctor, a, you'd get an EKG, you'd see the orthopod, which, which is an orthopedic surgeon, and you would uh, get your blood, you'd get your urine. There is nothing worse than giving a urine sample surrounded by players who make you feel as though that there's no chance that you could possibly keep up. Yeah, I went through that for 18 years. I always took pride, though, in having the lowest cholesterol on the team. I always liked winning the physical. It was the only way to ever beat any player in anything. Yeah, I'm healthier than you. Yeah, I know you can throw a 95. Yeah, but look at my resting pulse rate. That's right. I set off the buzzer. I'm at 39. I always got laughed at by the players. We always had fun with that. We'd compare our sheets because you get a printout with what your sheets are. Look at your creatine level. God, look at your LDL, it's horrific. In any case, so what I think is gonna happen is that eventually when there's a vaccine or an antibody test and it's completely available to everyone, just like when you go to school, you have to, your child needs a physical. They need medical forms filled out. When you go to camp, you need medical forms filled out. Stick with school. College, you have to take a physical. I think before you're gonna be allowed into a sporting event, you're gonna have to show proof proof that you have gotten some sort of test and there will be temperatures taken of people just like when you go through TSA if you fly in an airport and they're checking your bags there was one guy who put a bomb in his shoes now you take your shoes off one guy put a bomb in candy and now my black jelly beans are taken out of the bag every single time I fly I believe that there will be temperatures that have to be taken. I believe there will have to be proof of health that will have to be given, that you have the vaccine or the antibodies. This is not tomorrow, folks. Our reality is that there's a much better chance of getting sports back without fans sooner than sports back with fans. And we're gonna have to be okay with that because that's gonna be the new normal. And we're gonna love it. We're gonna find ways to fall back in love with sports and it won't be the horse competition. I give credit to MLB for doing it. I'm glad they did. One of the other uh, problems with what's happening with coronavirus, and this is something that is a bit of a longer subject, and I want to spend a few minutes on it because I think people may not understand how it works. I want to talk about college athletics. I want to talk about the purpose of college. There's a lot of people who debate the purpose of college. Do you need a college education? Is it worth it to have so much debt when you come out of college? The answer is if you spend four years partying, not going to classes, not learning a thing, and not putting yourself in a better position intellectually, then no, it's not worth it to go to college. If you just want to have a social life, do it somewhere else. You don't have to pay. Go to a bar. Go to the beach. But in college, that is where learning happens. That is where people go. Why do I like it when players from Duke turn pro after a year? It's okay they don't have their degree. They're being drafted in the lottery or in the first round, maybe the second round if they're one and done, and they will make more money as a professional basketball player in one year than any college graduate in their class three years later. So you go to college to prepare yourself to make a living. In order to do that, you go to class, whether it's online or in person, whatever the new normal is, and you take it seriously. 
What about college sports and how much we love going to football games every Saturday, how much we love the NCAA tournament, basketball that is, how much we love when we live in a dorm or we meet people. You're on the baseball team. You're on the lacrosse team. Wow, you're hot. I'm talking about guys, girls, anybody, people who don't identify, doesn't matter. I'm just saying that it's cool to meet college athletes. There's intramural athletics. Where do you think the money comes for college athletic departments? Well, there's two places. One, by wealthy alumni donors who donate money to their colleges and to their alma maters for the sole purpose of a college athletic program. Two, it comes out of the budget. The budget of a college and the revenue of a college comes from several places. One, tuition. Two, other. What's other? Broadcast rights, fees, tickets sold to sporting events. Think about that if you are, let's just pick a school. Let's pick my alma mater. Yeah, that's right. If I have a chance to pick a school, I'm going to pick Wisconsin. I'm a Badger. Camp Randall Stadium sold out. People buying tickets, alums buying tickets, students buying tickets, buying concessions, buying beer, buying cheese, buying wine. The college football program makes a huge profit. Wait, there's a Big Ten network? No, there's not. There's a network that shows Big Ten games? Well, I'll bet you one thing, the network has to pay the Big Ten and the Big Ten distributes that money to member schools. That is a huge line item. Football teams are a profit center. That profit is used to pay other expenses in the school that are not profit centers, like lacrosse, like water polo, like golf, like tennis, like soccer. There are scores of athletic teams who are paid for because of college basketball men's and college football men's. What happens when the majority lion's share of revenue for college basketball doesn't come in because there was no NCAA tournament? What happens if there's no college football season? Which by the way, there can't be a college football season with fans. I'm telling you now that's not gonna happen. A college football season where the campuses are still online and they're closed, that's not going to happen. You can't bring college student athletes back to school for the sole purpose of having a football game. There's got to be school in session on campus. Now, I know the college football student athletes are more athletes than students. Some of them are more students than athletes. Depends on the school, but they're all student athletes, no matter where, even at the U the Ohio State University, University of Miami, Michigan, Oregon, LSU. I could go on. Clemson, you wanna stop me now? Coca, I'll keep going. I'll name every single NCAA Division I school. All of them need fans, they need the broadcast rights, they need the games to go on. And if they don't, there will be changes to college sports and those changes will not be temporary. And it has already started. Today it was announced that Cincinnati has canceled, not postponed, not halted. They have canceled and ended the men's soccer team. The men's varsity college soccer team is gone. This is the first announcement of what will be many. Do you think that a lacrosse athlete is less special than a football athlete? Do you think that lacrosse deserves to be canceled when football is not gonna be canceled no matter what? The answer is companies make decisions. College universities, campuses, the presidents of those universities, those are CEOs, those are men or women making decisions, business decisions. You think they like the football players more than the soccer players at Cincinnati or at Michigan or at Wisconsin or at Yale or anywhere else? No, they look at who's funding who. Who's funding who? Cincinnati is not the last school this is going to happen. So when you're thinking about college athletics and you're thinking about a sport that you used to play or a sport that you love to play or a sport that you love to watch, just know that those sports are in jeopardy and they're in jeopardy because of coronavirus. They're in jeopardy because we have had this shutdown, which was completely necessary. 
very likely came a month too late because it could have been shortened and lives could have been saved. And now without a vaccine or an antibody test, we just don't know when or how it ends. Teams, leagues, everybody is trying to find a way, a path forward, a way to move forward. They just don't have it yet. There was actually a statement that came out today from the director of athletics, John Cunningham, after this announcement. And he said, this was a difficult decision, but one made with the long-term interests of UC athletics at the forefront. During this time of profound challenges and widespread uncertainty, I have engaged in a comprehensive and thorough review of UC sport offerings and long-term budget implications of supporting the number of student athletes currently at UC. Based on this review and in consultation with President Pinto and other university leaders, UC Athletics will no longer sponsor a men's soccer program. Now, I swear to you, you have no way of knowing this because if you're looking at me, thank you. If you're listening to me, thank you. But that quote was just given to me by Coca after I had explained exactly what went on in the decision-making process, confirmed by the director of athletics. Why did I know what they went through and what process they went through at UC? Because that's what every business is doing. It's not even a question. It's a guarantee. Thank you, Coca. That's some value added. By the way, thanks for downloading, rating, subscribing. Go to Apple, do a five-star write a review, and then put a question in that review. I do an end of month mailbag, mail, I do an end of month mailbag pod where I answer your questions. First Saturday of every month. So the first Saturday of May, I don't know what day that is. I think we're only in mid April, but I can't be sure. I think it's April 14th. Ah, I'm just kidding. I know it's April 14th. So thank you. And by the way, tell a friend, I got something called the, uh, I like it. This is something I'm doing. I started this. Not the ML Beer Challenge, started that. I started another thing. It's called the Quarantined Lifetime Best Picture Challenge. The Quarantine Lifetime Best Picture Challenge means that you need to watch the movie that won Best Picture every year that since you've been alive. I was born in 1968. I am re-watching or watching for the first time and will review every single best picture movie. There have been 51 of them since I was born. Yesterday, I started with Oliver. I'd never seen it in 1968. I'm not going in order because I don't feel like it. I do everything in order. I have lists. I am by the minute, by the second. One thing that Coke has been very, really good to me, it's been really good over these 114 episodes plus the bonus episodes. I used to be ruled by the time per segment and ruled we have to start at this minute, end at this minute, even from the middle of a thought. Anyway, moving on to Christian McCaffrey. No, I'm just kidding, Coca. That was a joke, right? I was moving on to Christian McCaffrey because it's time under my slot to be done with the sting. But I'm not done. I didn't even start, and I'm okay with it. We'll get to Christian McCaffrey and $64 million. The $64 million pyramid. Does anyone get that? Anyone ever watched the $64,000 pyramid? And it was so unreal when people were winning $100 and $200. And you had a celebrity and then the guest and they had to guess the category. All right, here's the category. The category is movies. And I'm going to give you clues and you have to guess the movie. This is not the top of the pyramid, but it's in the $64 million <clears throat> pyramid. Robert Redford, Paul Newman, the guy from Jaws. He's gonna need a bigger boat. Deception, fake death. Yes, Coca got it. I'm just kidding. He didn't say a word. The guy's silent. Unbelievable. He doesn't say one word. He doesn't type. He doesn't say. Although he did give me the quote. It's the sting. The best picture winner from 1973. It was amazing. I absolutely loved it. It is a. It is sort of the precursor to all of the sort of, um, the, there's a movie called The Grifters with Annette Bening and John Cusack, a great movie. There's a movie called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Unbelievable. With Michael Caine and Steve Martin, this is sort of how these movies started. 
a movie about two men. They're con men. They get together and pull a con on the guy from Jaws who needs a bigger boat. His name is Robert Shaw. It's called The Sting. It's worth it. And the music by Marvin Hamlish. And it's sort of the, uh, I was going to say Janis Joplin, but I don't think that's right. I think it's, uh, I think it's Scott Joplin. No, that's not. I feel like I'm singing That's All, folks. The end of the Warner Brothers cartoons. That's all, folks. I actually don't know. Anyway, good music. Won the Oscar. I'm going to be reviewing 51 movies, not over 51 days, because I may want to do something else. For example, I got to So You Want to Talk to Samson. Hey, can you please review and give me your top five Gene Hackman movies? I'm in the mood to do that. I may do it tomorrow, or I may review another Best Picture movie. Or maybe I'll review season one of Grey's Anatomy and tell you how many episodes it took for me to cry. One. Christian McCaffrey. He's something, huh? Do you know who that is? The guy, I don't know if you remember him. He plays for a team called the Panthers in the National Football League. He was the third player in NFL history. In all of the NFL history, all of it. Third one to have 1,000 yards rushing and 1,000 yards receiving. When you get 1,000 yards rushing in a season, you're really good. When you get 1,000 yards passing in a season, you are really good. Receiving yards, you're really good. McCaffrey did both, 1,000 yards rushing and 1,000 yards receiving. This guy's not normal. He's a Superman. He's Lee Majors. I actually don't know whether he's had surgery. I don't know if I can call him Lee Majors. Does anyone know what Lee Majors is? Who that is? Farrah Fawcett's husband? Remember Farrah Fawcett Majors? Lee Majors? Anyway. He's not bionic. He's a man. And the Panthers gave him $64 million over four years. Now, in baseball, that would mean that he'd be getting paid $16 million a year for four years guaranteed. In football, the guarantee was about half that in this case, so he's got $32 million. But if he plays for the next four years under this contract, then he would get 16 a year for four years. By the way, he is now the highest paid running back in NFL history. Who did it used to be for a dollar, Mortimer? Ezekiel Elliott. Made 15 a year last year. Le'Veon Bell, 14. But let's look at these long-term deals. How do they work out for teams, would you say? Well, as a guy who still has one year left on the way in Chen deal, <laughs> yikes. Uh, an MP, baby. Not my problem. Long-term deals are tough. They're tough in every sport. It's hard to have them work out. I'm going to give you four names of players you may or may not have heard of. If you're a big NFL fan, you've heard of them. If you're not, you may have heard of them. You'll remember if you're a nothing personal fan that I meant to say Marshawn Lynch and I said Richard Sherman one time and I had to correct myself on why the Seahawks didn't win the Super Bowl the year they were intercepted at the end of the game on a fourth and one from the one and they didn't run Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch signed a long-term deal, at least $10 million a year, four years or more. Guess what? Traded after year one of that deal. See you later. How about Adrian Peterson? Yeah, that Adrian Peterson. Cut after year two of a deal four years or longer, 10 million or more per year, NFL running back. Who remembers David Johnson, otherwise known as the bag of chips and balls that was traded to the Houston, Texas for DeAndre Hopkins? We talked about that on Nothing Personal. He's in the middle of a long-term deal, traded after year two. How about Todd Gurley? We talked about him yesterday and the day before. Remember the Deion Sanders 21 jersey? That was from yesterday's Nothing Personal. Cut after year two, which was just now, after he signed a four-year, $60 million deal. Why do teams continue to do this? They do it because they are positive that they're not like anybody else. They know for certain they're smarter than everyone else and every other executive. They know that long-term deals don't work, but they're sure that their scouts are different, that they've lived with that player and they know better, that they were just part of a successful season and it's only gonna get better. What do you mean? It may not happen. Can you imagine if you spend your life trying to buy stocks in the stock market and the only time you were allowed to buy was at the absolute highest price Of every stock you ever bought, you bought at the high, guess what happens? They then go down and you lose. When you sign players at their height, 
you are guaranteed to have it fail. Christian McCaffrey, 64 over four. He's not for Schwunt. I think it's just for Schwunt. For Schwunt? But well, guess what? He's done. You know, one other note, just, uh, just a little business note. If anyone's listening out there who wants to run a business, a big time, nothing personal concept here. You know it's just business and nothing personal. Don't worry, that's not the end of the show. It's only been a half hour. I got 15 minutes left with you. The fact is, when you've got years left of control over a player, don't sign him to an extension. How many times have I said it? How many? McCaffrey had two years left on his rookie deal. Two years. And you sign him after a historic season? An extra way to see that I'm not going to remember, although I will because I'm going to keep track of it. Coca, market, an extra way to see. Christian McCaffrey will not be a Panther four years from now. Book it. It's extra. So you want to talk to Samson, one of my faves. This was awesome. So the Patriots give us great content. You guys love it because you're all sending questions about Patriots, about Brady, about Belichick. So you want to talk to Samson, get onto my Twitter. Get onto my Twitter. Get into my belly. So you want to talk to Samson, DM me a question, I'll answer. Will Bill Belichick ever open up about his true feelings, Ray, Tom Brady going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? That's a great question. Bill Belichick, we've done phone calls for Bill Belichick before, you know that, right? We've spent a ton of time pretending we are Bill Belichick because I know exactly the way he is. Spoken to Bill Parcells about him. Maybe the greatest coach of all time. But he is uh, special. He doesn't like talking. He makes Greg Popovich look like a chatterbox. Do I have to explain that reference? Greg Popovich, coach of the San Antonio Spurs. Ever seen him interviewed? So, Greg, that was one heck of a first half. You know, you've got Tim Duncan with 20 points and 10 rebounds. Guys are the best team in the league. What do you think it's going to take to hold off the Lakers in the second half? Yeah, we got to keep going. Greg, to follow up on that, what do you think, uh, what are you telling your team right now? You know, you're uh, only shooting 70% from the free throw line and you only have got eight attempts versus the Lakers, 52 attempts. Anything going on? What are you telling the team? Yeah, we got to keep going. Get my drift? That's Bill Belichick. The answer to your so you want to talk to Samson is never. He will never open up about his true feelings because, A, I don't know that he knows his true feelings. Do you know how many hours and years of therapy it is going to take me to figure out my true feelings or to figure out what happened to the emotions? I'm going to need a raise. I'm going to need a bigger boat. So, Tom, so Bill Belichick was asked yesterday, he gave an interview, first interview since Brady went to the Bucks. Remember the statement that we did on Nothing Personal about Bill Belichick's statement and the fact that Bill Belichick didn't write one word of that statement and neither did Robert Kraft? Remember that? Well, when you ask a question directly to Bill Belichick, guess what? You're going to get an answer from Bill Belichick. It'll be a Popovich-like answer, but here's the answer, and boy, was it telling. So Bill gave an interview and asked about Tom Brady. Here's what he said, and I quote, I think that is water under the bridge. We're really focused on this season. Wow. Epic. What an answer. Water under the bridge. Do you think that's the last time, Bill, that you're going to be asked about Tom Brady? Do you realize you're going to be asked about him every single day for this entire season? Every time that your new quarterback throws an interception or has a bad game or a good game, you're going to be asked about Tom Brady? Every time Tampa Bay wins or loses or Brady throws an interception or touchdown pass, you're going to be asked about Tom Brady. Do you know that it's never going to stop? It's not a 45-minute pod, my friend. It's forever. But then he continued, and I quote, this was awesome. Over the last two decades, everything we did, every decision we made in terms of planning is made with the idea of what's best for Tom Brady. 
Whoever the quarterback is will try to make things work smoothly and efficiently for that player. Try to take advantage of his skills. Did you guys catch that quote, folks? Over the last two decades, everything we did, every decision we made in terms of planning was made with the idea of what's best for Tom Brady. Do you think that Bill Belichick was trying to answer the question of whether or not it was Brady who made Belichick or Belichick who made Brady? Do you think it was the Mutual Admiration Love Society? Oh my God, I love you, Tom. Oh, Bill, you're the greatest coach ever. No, it was the anti-love fest because there's ego involved. You've heard me say what kind of ego Brady has. You think Belichick doesn't have an ego? Do you think Bill Belichick doesn't have an ego? It's healthy, it's wealthy. And it's wise. This quote was a passive aggressive quote against Tom Brady and a passive, a active. What's the opposite of a passive aggressive? I just overtly aggressive quote for everyone to feel and understand that he is the man who made the partnership work. He devised a system to put Tom Brady in the best position to succeed. I actually happen to agree with Bill Belichick. I think a football coach has the most impact on wins and losses than any coach of any other sport, period, end of sentence. I think that it is possible that Bill Belichick knew that Tom Brady was fine, but Bill Belichick put players around him and put a system in that made Brady better than he was. What was Brady good at and what do you need to win a Super Bowl? You need to have ice water in your veins. You need to be George Gervin, the ice man cometh. He's a former basketball player, ABA, NBA. He was so good. Played for the San Antonio Spurs. That's all a tie back to Popovich, who didn't coach him, of course. But in any case, you have to put an assistant that puts your players in the best position to succeed. You have to know your players better than they know themselves because players will not help you. Players all believe they can thread the needle with a bounce pass on a fast break one on three. Actually, would it be three on one, one on three? Who would you pass to except someone from the other team? Players believe that they can execute a 3-2 slider perfectly to a right-handed pitcher as a lefty. Maybe they can, maybe they can't. We're going to tell you, and we're going to tell you whether or not you can, and then you got to do it. And the ones who can do it the way we say to do it, they're going to succeed the most. Who is better, Belichick or Brady? Hmm, interesting. Well, we did it. We finally made it to day 30. Today is day 30 of the ML Beer Challenge. It is the final day of giving $1,000 away to the 30 teams for the next 70 days or until baseball has opening day. I'm still giving away $1,000 a day, still giving it to organizations in South Florida. But for the previous 29 days, I've given away in alphabetical order $1,000 to every team foundation. Those team foundations are in the best possible position to give money away to those in need, those impacted. So who's my 30th team? Because if you're paying attention, you know that the Nationals got $1,000 yesterday and W's last. Only one person came up with the team that I missed. And do you think I missed a team by accident? Do you think I went from the Tigers to the Royals just by happenstance? Do you think? No, I skipped the Astros because I went full Vanessa Williams. Vanessa Williams, full Vanessa Williams. Saving the best for last. Google it. I'm just kidding. Listen to the song. You'll cry. It's a beautiful song. The Houston Astros get $1,000 today, and we're going to change things up a little bit. We're actually going to ask the Astros not to give $1,000 to seasonal workers. We're not going to ask the Astros to give it away to restaurant owners or other people who've been impacted by coronavirus. Instead, we are asking the Houston Astros, with this $1,000, to purchase a thousand dollars worth of garbage cans and to deliver those garbage cans to hospitals around the Houston area. Do you think I'm kidding? Would I kid about garbage cans in Houston? I don't think I would. I think it's perfect because the Houston Astros are on a redemption tour and they better start taking it seriously, this redemption tour, because their prayer They didn't wish for COVID-19, I promise you that. 
they make too much money. But are they excited and happy that no one's talking about the Astro sign stealing scandal and trash can banging scandal? Yeah, but not so excited because they're doing everything they can to make amends as they should be. After that pathetic, ridiculous apology press conference by Jim Crane, by the lack of preparation given to the players when they were all over the place, by the mea culpas from players outside of the Astros organization, it is now time for the Astros to take a stand. They're going to stand up and say yes. They're going to acknowledge everything they did way more than they have. They're going to acknowledge trash cans. They're going to spend $1,000, buy trash cans, deliver them. Do good. The Astros do a lot of good. Before the side ceiling scandal, they are really good in their community, both under Drayton McClain, the previous owner, and Jim Crane, the current owner. I grant you, I have been all over Jim Crane, all over him, because he's had so many missteps. And that's my job on nothing personal. But when things are good, I'm going to say it. He does a great job raising money and giving money away in his community. They've had a lot of natural disasters, tragedies, problems in Houston. And guess what? This is another one. But how about standing up, Houston? How about one time? Just stand up. Just stand up. Because if you do, you could stand up and, you know what? Poke a little fun at yourself. All of us are looking for a laugh right now. All of us are looking at videos and going crazy and binging and doing this and doing that, figuring out when social distancing will end. If it'll end, will I always have to wear a mask? How will it be if I wear a mask? How will I differentiate myself? I used to be good looking. I was never good looking. Now I want to wear a mask. I was good looking. I don't want to wear a mask. I want to wear a mask that shows my individuality. I'm going to start painting the mask. If I paint the mask and draw on the mask, is it possible the mask won't be as effective? How many times can I use a mask? If I spray the mask with Lysol, will the liquid paper that I use to write my name on the mask or the shirt that has to be silver if you have a black mask or black if you have a white mask or if it's a blue medical mask should you even write on the mask will it go through will it will it bleed these are all major questions that we have it's serious well the astros could help us laugh take a thousand bucks buy yourself some garbage cans and deliver them ML Beer Challenge, day 30, starting tomorrow, $1,000 a day for the next 70 days, and I'm still not shaving, neither is Coca. By the way, we've taken pictures every day for the last 30 days. We're going to do one of those cool time-lapse things, which I have no idea how to do, but after MLB comes back on opening day, or as soon as we can, because we're going to need our main man, Greg. Greg, our main man. Greg, you're my main man, Greg. Greg, my main man. No, I'm not reviewing Rain Man yet. That was Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. We'll get to that. It was a best picture. That's part of the quarantine lifetime best picture challenge. Just not today. So we're taking pictures. Day 30, the beard. It's done. <sighs> okay. Wait to see. I do wait to sees a lot. And my wait to sees are interesting only in that when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And when I'm right, I'm right. But you're going to hear about it. Just today... Or was it yesterday? Either today or yesterday, Steve Pierce retired. I want to give a shout out to Steve Pierce. Steve Pierce is a uh, 10-year veteran, Major League Baseball player. A typical utility, I call him a utility guy. He was an okay big leaguer. 10 years, fully pensioned, fully vested. It's hard to be a 10-year big leaguer. He's more famous for the fact that he was the MVP of the 2018 World Series. The MVP for the Red Sox when they won the World Series. Did you remember that? Could you have named that? On that roster, with Mookie Betts as the MVP of the season, Steve Pierce was the MVP of the World Series. Because in World Series, you get high, you hit three home runs, done, hot, MVP. He announced his retirement. Why? Because he didn't get a contract, can't really play anymore. But while announcing his retirement, he did something that I don't think was necessary for him to do, and that is going to be my wait to see. Steve Pierce looked into the microphone, he looked into the radio camera, and he said, the Red Sox did nothing wrong in 2018. I assure you that our World Series was completely clean. When we saw that there was an investigation of the Red Sox, we laughed, it was nothing. Steve Pierce is now on record. Except here's the small problem with going on record without having seen the report from Major League Baseball because they've investigated the Red Sox and they actually have not 
given out their conclusions. He actually believes that the Red Sox will have no punishment at all. Well, Steve, my wait to see is, A, you had a good career. I don't have to wait to see that. My wait to see is the Red Sox did do something. The MLB report will reflect that the Red Sox were involved in some nefarious cheating. It didn't give you your World Series. It didn't give you your MVP. But the Red Sox clearly did something. Maybe you know the report's going to say nothing because with COVID and all the other problems people are having, MLB doesn't want to pile on. But I think they've got to release that report. And when they do, Steve, wait to see. The Red Sox will be implicated, but punished less than the Astros. That was a previous wait to see. And in that report, in a tiny footnote written by a lawyer underneath a line that talks about what the punishment will be, that little footnote from a very loyal person in the commissioner's office will say, hey, Boston Red Sox, this was just business. It was nothing personal.